Good evening, everybody. Hello, my name is Mark. I'm going to be your, your host for this evening. Um, so tonight's workshop, we are focusing on identifying edible medicinal and poisonous plants in and around Montreal or Quebec. Now, I just want a quick um, kind of uh, gauge of your experiences already. If you want to write in the chat, how many of you feel confident IDing stuff? How many of you had like have uh, done any foraging before? Like, uh, what would you say your plant identification levels are at already? Let me know if I'm going from a complete beginner, which is perfectly okay, or maybe some of you have already, <laughs> that's a zero there. <laughs> okay, uh, beginner, super, right? Um, you know, most people extremely basic. Great. Okay. Well, um, I will start off by introducing myself a little bit, and then we'll get into the subject of the material. So, I am, I am uh, English, born and raised. I moved to Canada about six years ago, and I, when I first came to Montreal, my very first job was a video games tester. I was working in an office, not doing anything plant related. And slowly but surely, I got into growing. I started growing indoors without a balcony, without even a, um, a garden, just uh, doing hydroponics. And then I took a, a gardening, uh, it was a vegetable production internship um, with the folks at the Concordia University. They have something called the City Farm School. And there I took a, an internship on vegetable production and medicinal herb. Um, herbalism, essentially, an introduction to herbalism, and this was four years ago. Um, after doing that, I got a kind of a part-time job as a gardener, and then I started uh, teaching about um, medicinal herbs primarily. I started farming herbs. I had rented land in an organic farm in the South Shore for two years, and for the last three years, I've been working at Vanier College as a kind of their external educator, half gardener, half teacher. Um, we're starting a permaculture food forest there. I brought a lot of different plants to their gardens. And if any of you are interested, you can always come join me as a volunteer this year as well. So uh, that's a little bit about me. And for all of you who are beginners, don't worry. I was in the same boat as all you folks not too long ago. Um, so I will now share my screen and we shall start the class here. So let me go from the beginning and move us down here. Okay, so um, identifying Quebec edible, medicinal, and poisonous plants. So before I get into the main material, I would like to do some acknowledgments. Uh, the first one is the land we are on, um, at least here in Montreal, in the traditional territories of the Ganyagahaga people of Turtle Island and other First Nations of Turtle Island. And um, I like to kind of take a moment to recognize that fact and move forwards in the spirit of reparations. Uh, not only is it the land and the waters I would like to acknowledge, but the, the knowledge itself. I've had the pleasure of uh, going to Ganawagi uh, quite, a, quite a few times now to teach, and I have had uh, a little bit of knowledge passed down through the times that I've gone there to me. I studied in Western herbalism. I come from Europe, and because of this beautiful thing called the internet, uh, I have a lot of different sources from all around the world. So the, not only the land is on, that we're on is um, from many different sources, but the knowledge that I'm sharing with you uh, this evening is as well. And finally, I always like to give a little bit of um, acknowledgement to the plants themselves. Uh, without them, we wouldn't have the air we breathe, the food we eat, the clothes we wear. So um, a little bit of gratitude before we move on is always something uh, I like to do. Okay, so this evening, we are going to be focusing on an introduction to herbal transformations. I am a herbalist, self-taught herbalist by trade. And so I'm gonna be talking a lot about how to use some of these plants medicinally. Um, so I want to introduce to you kind of how uh, the kind of a herbalist toolkit, as it were. Uh, why should we eat wild plants? This is a, a little something to kind of maybe um, inspire some curiosity, ignite a flame. 
Then we're going to talk about foraging practices, so how to go outside and harvest wild plants safely. Then we're going to look a little bit into botany and how plants are classified. Then we're looking at, especially winter, we're getting into spring now, but we're going to look at how we can identify plants all year round, not just in spring, summer, fall, when there's actually flowers and leaves, but also in the winter as well. Then we're going to do a virtual park walk through Park La Fontaine plan and finally I'll have some resources for you at the end. Um, I will mention uh, as well if you have any questions uh, you can um, write it down in the chat or unmute yourself go right ahead. Je connais comment presque tout le nom pour les plantes en français. Mon niveau de français est, est pas mal aussi. Uh, Alors, si j'ai besoin d'expliquer quelque chose un peu plus uh, en français, uh, je peux essayer. <laughs> so, uh, like, uh, yeah, don't be afraid to ask questions in French or English, and we'll figure it out between us. Okay, so moving on to herbal transformations. Uh, these are ways that we can use medicinal plants. And I just want to spend five minutes going over the main ways that we can do this to give you an idea when I'm talking about how to use these plants later on that you actually know what I'm talking about. So first one is a tea, a tisan. This is a water-based preparation using aromatic herbs ready within five to 16 minutes. So most people have made a cup of tea for themselves before. And uh, not just your, you know, if you've made a chamomile cup of tea or if you made a green tea, like these are all uh, in this category here. This is a picture from my uh, farm once upon a time. And one of the simplest and easiest ways to use herbs, uh, fresh or dry. Now we're moving on to something called a nourishing herbal infusion. So for folks who are interested in getting a bit of nutrition from uh, wild plants, this is a way that we take, you can see here in this mason jar, there's a large amount, this is nettle in here, stinging nettle. There's a large amount of herb in here that we use dry and we let it sit for four hours. The idea being that in those four hours, all of the minerals that are in there have the time to come out into that boiling water and we really get a, a nutritive and somewhat delicious acquired taste, I'll tell you that, um, but a delicious drink nonetheless. And I'll be, oh, there's only a few herbs that we do this with, um, and I'll be sharing those later on. Next, we have a tincture. So tinctures are alcohol preparations using fresh plants. So what we do is we, we take our jar, we chop up our plant, we fill the jar and then you fill it in the top with vodka. And then uh, six weeks later, you strain it out and I carry one of my tinctures here. Let's make sure you can see it. Yeah, this is my chamomile tincture here. So I took fresh flowers at some point last year. And the idea is that vodka is able to extract, uh, well, alcohol is able to extract certain medicinal properties that water cannot. And with chamomile, for example, I have in my hand here, a nice little pocket anxiety remedy. If I'm on the metro and I'm getting way too stressed out, I can reach into my pocket and put some of this into my water or straight into my mouth if I want. And within about five to 10 seconds, I start to feel a little bit calmer and a little bit cooler. And we can pretty much make tinctures out of nearly every medicinal plant out there. And depending on the plant, depends on the effect of the tincture as well. Kind of everything is different. Moving on. We have a decoction. So this is where we boil a plant uh, or lightly simmer it uh, for two to six hours generally. And it's done mostly with um, stronger or tougher parts of the plant like bark or branches or roots. Although here we can see it's being done with the, uh, the uh, leaves as well. And this is when we want a bit more oomph to get the, the, the medicinal properties out of our plants. A poultice. So a poultice is um, when we take plant material, we chop it up or we mash it up somehow, and then we wrap it in a cloth and you apply it on the skin or the body somewhere. And this is something we would do in a first aid context. Say you're in the wild and you've got a mosquito bite, you can easily make yourself a poultice by chewing up a few leaves and then spitting it out and putting it on the bite or wrapping it in a cloth and, and uh, putting it on there. And we would use this for things as well as kind of sprained ankles 
or um, jo joints that are painful or inflamed, and it's a way of using herbs externally. And then another way we can use them externally is to make herbal oils. Pretty much like a tincture, you chop up your plant material, then we pour uh, olive oil, is one of my favorite things to use, over the top of the plant, let it infuse again for six weeks, strain it out, and then you've got yourself a medicinal oil. Let's say chamomile, for example. If I was to put fresh chamomile flowers into olive oil and then take that out after six weeks, I've got an oil which is anti-inflammatory, antibacterial. I could rub it onto my neck to kind of release tension and have a nice uh, relaxing uh, muscles, a relaxing muscle salve. And I can also heat it up and melt a bit of wax in there to make things like chapsticks or lip balms or other kinds of ointment and even face cream if you want to get a little bit more complex as well. And the last one here, herbal vinegars. So vinegar has its own medicinal properties and we can make it even extra stronger by adding in medicinal plants. This picture here is a, a very well-known herbalism recipe called fire cider. And essentially this is um, taking things like garlic, chilies, onions, ginger. We can see here there's an echinacea flower there's also some burdock root and a rose hip in there. And the idea is when you get a little bit sick in the beginning of winter, you've got that tickle in your throat, take a tablespoon or two of this fire cider and the garlic and the chili right there will kind of warm you up and give a, a boost to your immune system to try and fight uh, any infections that are going on. And we can use vinegars as well to clean out wounds, to wash our hair, uh, to clean surfaces. I'm going to be talking about how to make yourself a nice pine cleaner later on uh, using this vinegar. Okay, so ah, yes, one more, the herbal honeys. So this one, if anyone suffers from a lot of sore throats, here's a recipe for you. You take fresh garlic, you chop it up, you pour honey over the top and you leave it there. And within a few weeks, um, your honey, will, your garlic will turn translucent and then you've got yourself a herbal sore throat remedy. The honey is very good at coloring and soothing the inside of the throat there. The uh, garlic is one of the strongest antibacterial herbs that we have available. So you've got a soothing bacterial fighting honey for your sore throat right there, which we can use um, internally and externally as well. If you've got uh, wounds, honey is a particularly, especially for burns, I believe, honey is a really good applicative for that. Great. Okay, all of this, we, it goes without saying that I'm not a medical professional and everybody out there has their own things going on. And when we're working with wild plants or medicinal plants in general, we do want to um, be careful. And there's kind of five groups here. I like acronyms. So PEMB is what I use to help me remember. And what this stands for is pregnancy, elderly, medication, breastfeeding, or young people. Anybody who's in these five categories here, we want to make sure that we are doing our research, that we're talking to our healthcare professionals uh, before we use medicinal plants. And generally speaking, 95% of the time, you're gonna be safe. You know, plants are not as strong as medication out there. Like, uh, though, there are some which um, can be quite surprising, talking about chamomile again. Uh, for example, pregnant women in their third trimester can have contractions started by chamomile tea. So this is uh, something that's very safe for the rest of the, uh, the population, but then one of these groups in here, we just want to really spend uh, a bit of extra time making sure that we're being safe uh, moving forward. Okay, so what is wild? So here we have a picture of uh, one of my favorite plants. This is plantain here. You will find this growing in the side cracks of the sidewalk, like this picture here all around Montreal. And this is a my favorite remedy. It's one of the first plants that I teach little children how to recognize because it's perfect for cuts and scrapes as well as mosquito bites. And here, it's not in a wild setting. It's in an urban pavement here. However, this is a wild plant because it's not being planted there. 
it's kind of blown in through the wind or being carried in by an animal and has started growing. So with this in mind, we can find many different wild plants growing in an urban context. And this allows us to really like, you know, once you kind of tune in, I think the, the, one of the most exciting parts for me about learning about plants was the fact that every time I would take a walk around my neighborhood, I would be able to pick out different plants that I'd learned about in my herbalism class that I found just growing on the side. And it was like really like a, an eye opener to be like, oh, wow, this has been here the entire time. And I've never even noticed it uh, until now. And, and you'll, as, a, as you learn more and more, that you'll, you'll come to realize that nearly every, every block around us has some kind of edible or medicinal plant that we're able to use when we know how. So why eat wild foods? Like, uh, you know, your supermarkets have plenty of delicious food uh, all year round. And what do we benefit from by eating wild foods? Now, some of you may have some suggestions. Do you want to write anything in the chat before I go over? Anyone you want to chime in here with uh, a reason as to why we would want to eat wild foods? Let me see the chat here. Yeah, I can. Here we go. I'll give you a, a short moment, and otherwise I'll go straight on with it. Don't worry about it if you have nothing to share. Oh, okay. Quiet class, that's all right. So benefits of wild foods. Um, ecologically sound. Healthy and sustainable. Thank you very much, Echo. So yes, this is uh, very much going along the uh, the same um, roots here. The idea that you can't get more local than what's growing around you wild. It's not being imported. Unfortunately, a lot of our food in the wintertime comes from you know, uh, California or Mexico. So we are being um, responsible citizens by looking into the wild foods. I know right now you can go up onto the mountain and find the spring greens that are growing and um, other things around us. The, this is something that I found for myself coming from England um, that uh, I learned about, I have a, so I have a company that I, I used to teach, it's called Naughty Nettle Medicinals. And the idea is that growing up in England, I was uh, surrounded by stinging nettle. It's as common as dandelions in, in the UK. And no one actually told me that you could eat or drink or even make clothes out of this plant until I came to Canada. And then I realized that actually for, for millennia before um, modern day civilization, my ancestors were using plants like stinging nettle and they were brewing them into uh, low alcoholic beers in order to make their drinking water safe. This is how European civilizations were able to purify and kill off bacteria was by brewing plants into beers such as nettle or yarrow and other things like this. And, and being able to do this for myself as a 21st century citizen, um, it really allowed me a moment to kind of connect and kind of rediscover this um, ancestral knowledge for myself and also make a fun alcoholic drink in the process. Uh, the earth connection is the idea that I have um, some particular plants and trees in Montreal now in the, the parks around me that I have gone to visit um, every year uh, when their season is right and I'll pick their flowers or I'll pick their seeds or I'll pick their fruit. And being able to go back to the same place every year allows me a connection. It allows me to build a relationship. It's something that um, I can celebrate every year. It's like, oh yeah, it's, it's the time to go pick the linden flowers. Off I go. And this wasn't something that I had before I I uh, was got into plants. Before you know, a tree was a tree and a weed was a weed. And and now my eyes have been opened up so much more. Probiotics. So this is an idea that um, I rarely wash the, the the plants that I eat out in the wild, as long as I'm, a, and I'll, we'll talk about, you know, what to do with dogs and cats and things like that. But 
generally speaking, the plants around me are very clean. The, the wind and the rain does a very good job at, at washing them. And by eating stuff that's directly come from the soil and hasn't been packed in a factory or washed in chlorine or any of these other processes, we get all of the healthy bacteria that are living on the leaf coming from the soil. When I eat that leaf, I get them in my own um, gut flora and fauna, and this uh, allows me to gain some beneficial bacteria much the same way that you can eat yogurt or any other fermented product. It's seasonal. So not only is it um, uh, ecologically sound, but we are really paying attention to what's coming into season in order to be able to forage it. Like if it's not in season, there's no way you can access it. It's free. This is a nice one uh, to think of. Certainly not the most important, but a nice one nonetheless. And it's a four season hobby. So even though we cannot necessarily harvest uh, all year round, you can certainly learn how to identify all year round. And then you can be like, oh, okay, so I think that, take for example, this picture in the back here, this is a wild carrot. And um, I'll talk about how to recognize this later on, but if I can find where this wild carrot is growing in the winter time, I know that come early spring, I can go there and find the carrots that I want to dig up out of the ground and eat for myself. So this is a four season hobby that you have, edible and medicinal. So a lot of wild foods contain medicinal properties that our modern day vegetables may have lost along the way of being um, genetically chosen and cultivated. Um, and this one says survival skills. So here, let me put just a small one, there we go. So uh, survival skills. The idea being that um, in a survival situation, we can uh, um, we can sure this person no I can't okay there's somebody with a microphone not muted uh, they can deal with that there um, so. Survival skills, the idea that if you're out in a forest, uh, there's, you're surrounded by wild foods, you'll have a few more um, skills to be able to um, harvest and survive out there in the wild. Here we go. So foraging practices. Um, first one is to know your plants. The idea being that uh, I was talking about um, so I'm just gonna, Farina, could you mute your microphone or Melis, could you do it for us? I think you can do that. Uh, just hear a little bit of an echo. Thank you. Okay, so let's carry on here. Um, okay, so knowing your plots. This is like the most important thing here because um, the plant, one of these plants is edible, delicious, nutritious. The other one is highly poisonous and a piece of the root the size of my thumb will kill you. And so knowing your plants is extremely important. Uh, this one here, for those who are interested, is poison hemlock. This is the poisonous one, the deadly hemlock. And over here we have wild carrot. Now, it's for this reason that I don't teach people how to, how to harvest wild carrot because they're very easily confused. And this is not a good place to start, okay? So knowing your plants and knowing what poisonous plants are out there is really kind of the key step. And you're taking the first step with this workshop here today. The idea is well that my workshop is going to teach you how to identify some plants in Park La Fontaine later on, the second half of this. However, um, you want to use multiple sources uh, for yourself. So, um, same thing goes, one of these is the poison hemlock and another one is the wild carrot. It's this one here, which is the wild carrot. And the, um, not just my online class here is enough for you to be confident foragers. What I recommend is that everybody uses multiple sources. Some good examples. This is a really good book here. And by the way, I'll make sure everyone gets the slideshow um, so you don't have to write too much down right now. And we are recording it too. So the um, Edible Medicinal Plants of Canada by the Lone Pine people is a really good book to start with. And they have a chapter on all the poisonous plants in Canada. So I recommend you start there. And then once you know your poisonous plants, you can then move on to the easier and less deadly ones. Um, another application. 
living in the 21st century, we have some quite sophisticated stuff uh, for identifying plants. Picture this is a really good app. You generally have to subscribe. It's like 20 bucks a year. However, you do get a number of free plant IDs per day that you can do, like some like five or, or something like that. And these are both good examples of different sources we can use to be confident. Now, for me, I generally want to use at least three different sources to be certain that I am identifying a plant. So taking this class could be one, using that book could be another, and then using the application could be your third one. So when you're, you find your wild plant and you're, you're having a look, the book works, the, the app works, what I shared, you remember, yeah, Mark was talking about this, then you can be like, okay, three sources, I'm good to go. There's a very important caveat here, don't try to make it fit. This is especially true for the plant guides. You'll be reading the botanical description and it'll say, well, the leaves are, are meant to be like this, but the leaves that I have in front of me are, are like similar, but they're not quite that. I'm gonna ignore that and just, and just pretend that it's the one that the book's talking about. Don't ignore it. Like don't try to make the plant fit the description. You want the description to fit the plant. So it is, especially at the beginning, being, um, it is tempting to be like, okay, I've got this. I know what it is. It's not 100% correct, but that's okay. No, you want to be 100% correct. I mean, uh, knowing your soil is pretty important. This is a map of the contaminated soils on the island of Montreal. And for example, if you're going to go take a walk around the botanical gardens, there was a, I think this, this red thing here means that it was a uh, trash pile, like a garbage dump at some point. So you may want to think twice about harvesting where that previous trash pile was because the plants will kind of relive the history of the soil. So if there's a lot of contaminants in that soil, the plants are going to have them too. So knowing your soil is a very important part um, of foraging. Avoid busy areas. So here we can see this, this cute dog here. Um, generally speaking, I don't harvest things in busy areas that are kind of knee height or below. In urban areas, this means pretty much, you know, everything that's on the ground, I won't touch. Things that are in planters or grown behind fences, like these are a lot more safer because we don't have to worry about a lot of urban dog walkers and other pests. Um, adding extra seasoning to our plants. Uh, starting small is also a very important uh, part of this. The idea being that you may identify, you've got your three sources, you've identified your first edible plant, and then you just go nuts and harvest a whole bunch of it, bring it home, and then realize that maybe it's really bitter or you don't know how to prepare it, and then the plant material is going to go bad, and all of a sudden you've wasted a whole bunch of good plants. So the um, sustainable level of harvesting in a wild situation is 5%. So this means that if you come across a berry, uh, berry, a bush of berries, and there's 20 berries on there, you take one of them for yourself and you need the other 19 for the birds and the bees and all the other animals. Um, I know in Ganawagi, I was taught that they have kind of a similar rule to this, which is they never um, take the first plant that they see. So let's say I was looking for that wild carrot. I walk into a, an area in Ganawagi and I find that um, I see one wild carrot plant. I leave that one alone. They say that that one's for everybody. And then I continue walking. And if I find another wild carrot, I could harvest that one if I want to. And from an ecological point of view, this makes a lot of sense because if there's a lot of rare plants, um, then, and there, there aren't many in the ecosystem, then if you can only find one of them, then you're going to leave that one alone and, and it will survive in that ecosystem. And if you find a second or a third one, you know that, okay, that there's enough here surviving for me to harvest a little bit in order to um, keep the uh, ecosystem biodiverse. And the last one is showing respect. So this plant here is um, what's known as Tulsi or Holy Basil. It grows very well in Quebec, but it is a traditional plant from Hindu culture. Mostly um, India and Nepal people grow this and it is given special reverence. They 
wash their hands before touching it. They say particular prayers before picking it. Um, it's watered as soon as the sun rises. And they believe that this plant is a reincarnation of their um, different gods. Now, I'm not suggesting that we kind of take the same amount of reverence, but still we can show respect. And in many different cultures, um, an offering is given, something physical. Uh, for myself, um, I just like to spend a moment when I'm before I start harvesting, when I'm about to forage, to share some gratitude. Um, I'm just in my own head or out loud, it really depends. Sometimes I'll sing a song if I'm really feeling up to it. And um, this is just my own personal way of, of giving a little something to the plants around me before I take something. Because you're entering, when you go foraging, you're, you're taking a, uh, a two-way relationship. It's not just all give or all take. It's, uh, you've got to give a little something in order to get something from the plant at the same time. So. Well, okay. So uh, we're moving now on to botany here. And this tree diagram here shows the evolution of plants uh, going from algaes at the very beginning to kind of um, uh, mosses. And then we have what are called gymnosperms, which are those that um, pollinate on the wind. And then we have over here angiosperms, which are those that pollinate with insects and birds and other, other uh, animals uh, on Earth. And um, like uh, these are like 900 8 to 1,000 million years old. Uh, gymnosperms came around 700 million years ago, and then angiosperms came around 300 to 400 million years ago, I think. Not so important, but just still a, a little bit of interesting ancestry. And for some of them, like your pine species or your, um, your ginkgos in here, there's the ginkgo. Like these could easily be found in Montreal, and they're like 700 million years old. So that's just a little something to keep in mind when you're walking around the city. Like you're, you're, you're in the... Um, presence of some very, very old and majestic plants. Uh, so plant families, this is a cute little picture here. This is kind of when you're beginning, uh, which many of you are, uh, to think about how to get into foraging or plant identification. Plant families is the place to begin. It's very overwhelming. There's like thousands of plants. Where do I begin? You start with plant families. There's a really good book that I will talk about later, actually. So first of all, um, how do we classify plant families? It was started, at least this system that we use today, it was started in the 1600s by a fellow called Carl Linnaeus. And he um, kind of caused a bit of a storm with the church at the time because the, uh, the church believed that um, kind of plants reproduced uh, immaculately with some kind of divine conception. Carl Linnaeus came along and said, no, it's all about sex. And I've created a botany system which classifies plants by their sexual reproductive organs, AKA their flowers. And the church really didn't like this, but Linnaeus went ahead and did his thing. And this is what we have today. So families are put into groups together by the structure and the shape of their flowers. So essentially every, let's see, let's see B here. There's um, one, two stamen and one pistil. Don't worry, I'll get into the, the lingo a little bit later. So every plant that has two of these and one of those is grouped together in the same family. And some plants, uh, some plant families have like 20,000 species in them because they all follow that same structure pattern. So for example, I will actually come back to this. I'm gonna go here, here. Okay, so flower. Um, let's do flower structure first. So there's a lot of information here. Like uh, maybe some of you, you, you maybe learned this as a teenager a long time ago, but good news is we don't need to learn a lot of this information. All we really need to learn are four things. First of all, we need to learn the female part, which is this red part in the middle here. It's called the pistil. Next, we need to know the masculine part, which is the stamen or etamin. And the easy way to remember this is uh, the, the stamen stays men. That's the way you remember that it's uh, uh, masculine. And this is what, if you touch on a plant, you'll get a little bit of pollen coming off on your fingertips. Um, 
And here we also have the colored parts of the flower are also called petal. And then underneath we have the sepal, which is what holds the flower. And unfortunately, sometimes they're the same color and size as the petals, but mostly they're green and they're smaller and they support the entire flower. So with these four things, I go back here now. Go. Okay, so this is from a website, Wild Flowers and Weeds. If you look for botany in a day, this is the book that it all comes from. And they have uh, a beautiful website where every single one of the plant families has a diagram like this. And you can learn how to identify the plant families from these diagrams. And this is kind of a really good place to start. So for example, let's start with the mint family. The mint family, for those who don't know, uh, contains nearly every kind of culinary herb. Uh, I say culinary because for in my book, culinary herbs are medicinal herbs and a lot of medicinal herbs are also culinary herbs. There's not really a clear distinction. But to give you an idea, in the mint family, there are such plants as thyme, basil, rosemary, sage, mm, oregano, or oregano, if you're in Canada, I suppose. Um, what else is there? Lavender, catnip, lemon balm. Like um, a lot of these plants, maybe not the last three, but a lot of the beginning plants we use to cook with uh, sage, if I didn't say that already, because they're in the mint family. Not only um, are they very aromatic and they have a lot of flavor, but they help with digestion. And so if we learn the patterns of the mint family, which is four stamens too long, too short. So the flower kind of has two stamens up above and then two stamens down below. We can kind of see that like it'll look like, a little bit like this. We can see it on the diagram here. Two tall ones, two short ones, and then it has five petals that are joined together and then five sepals, which are in these points here, that are also joined together. Uh, let's see, we got a question. Can we find mint on the in and around the island of Montreal? Not a silly, okay. First of all, no such thing as a silly question. All questions are welcome. So uh, to answer your question, can we find mint? Yes, but it's mostly growing in people's gardens. What you can find all around Montreal, especially in the plateau area, is something called purple catnip. And it is in the mint family. It's a low bush that has these beautiful purple flowers. And now you know when it's flowering, if you get into there and you peer into the flower and you find that there's four stamens, two, two tall, two short in that flower, you know that it's in the mid family. And then if you bring it home to your cat, they'll probably go nuts. And then you'll know that it's some kind of cat. So um, mint is fairly common, but it's normally planted in people's gardens. It's not one that we find in the wild so much. However, uh, this one here called self heal, which is a low growing plant with beautiful purple flowers, grows in your garden more and is quite a, uh, a common one um, that you can find growing around as well. So using this uh, diagram, we can identify the mint family. And in the mint family, there's like 2000 plant species. So just by learning the family, you've learned how to identify 2000 plants around the world, which is pretty cool. And botany in a day, they have this beautiful um, introduction section where they talk about eight plant families and they're kind of the common edible ones. And with these eight, you can identify 40,000 plants around the world that are edible or medicinal. So it's uh, really like, and that it takes you like less than an hour to learn the structure of these eight families. And then off you go. You don't necessarily know the individual species, but by identifying the family, you can start to learn about how to use that plant. And then you've got a lot um, fewer options to look through with the species. And the any field guide that's worth its weight in salt, like the, uh, the edible and medicinal plants of Canada, like I mentioned before, that is all done in plant families. So learning about your plant families is really the first place to go. And you can learn about them all for free on this website, which is linked later on in this presentation. So just a little bit more about families. So there's kind of families are the biggest group. And then we have what's called a genus, which is a bit more specific. And then we have individual species, which is a lot more specific. And to give you an idea, so 
a family is grouped by their reproductive organs. So their flowers have the same shape and structure. And then the genus has similar characteristics. And then the specific type for the individual, if it's a cultivar, coming down to the very kind of minute um, plant here. So let's say the rose family. In the rose family, um, for those who don't know, we have pretty much all of our uh, North American fruits are in the rose family from strawberries to apples to plums to pears. They're all in this family. And if we go down to, let's say, I'm interested in learning about roses. If I look at the rose or genus, there is around 500 species in here. And then there's one particular species, it's the Rosa gallica. And gallica, so um, the genus is kind of your grouping. And then the gallica here is a, um, it's a, normally an adjective that's added after the genus to give you a little bit of information. So Gallica here, I'm not 100% sure of my Latin all the time, but it's probably something to do with um, maybe Gaelic culture or something to do with the Mediterranean culture. Uh, a lot of the time there'll be colors. It'll be something like um, Echinacea purpurea. Purpurea means purple. Or Echinopodium alba. Alba means white. So Echino is uh, goose and podium is foot. So it's white goose foot. And so uh, when you kind of learn about the genuses and things, it really does help to unlock it, but it's not necessarily a, the easiest place to start. It's just a little bit of side information for you. Okay, so we've already gone through this. Now let's have a look at uh, winter specific identification. What do we have in the winter time to help us identify things? So first of all, we have the structure. I can see this big beautiful tree in the back here and I can tell certain things just by looking at the structure of this tree uh, that will help me identify it. We have bark, we have seeds, we have dead and alive leaves, we have buds, these are the, the bourgeons, the, the plants, leaves that are coming in the next spring, and we also have catkins which I will explain what they are later on. So breaking down plant structure. This is particularly um, good for recognizing trees. There's three categories, three broad categories of um, plant structure. And this is how the branches come off the main stem. We have alternate, where they come off kind of one after the other. We have opposite, where they come out in pairs. And then we have world, where they kind of come out in a big circle all around the stem. Now, a little um, few diagrams for you to show you this in action. So here we can see that this branch here, it has branches coming out, one, two, one, two. This is an opposite over here. And if we have a look at this tree on the right, here we can see they're coming out in pairs, one, two, one, two, one, two. So these are both opposite. This is a white ash and a red maple. Uh, these are both opposite trees here. This one here on the left, this beautiful plant, we can see that it's coming out in a radial pattern. This is a world uh, plant structure. And then here, if we have a look at this plant, we can see that there's one here by itself, one here by itself, one here. This is an alternate one. So this is horse tail, this is sumac. So just by having a look at some of these in the winter time, we'll be able to break it down. This one here, um, let me see the one on the left here, Someone tell me, is this alternate or opposite? And you can write it in the chat if you want. Anyone want to give it a go? Say alternate, but you're not sure. Well, congratulations, you are correct because there is no other bud on the other side of the branch. Here, there's one bud by itself. Here, there's another bud by itself. So, and then over here, if we have a look, this one, and it really, and this is something I should um, clarify. We can only really tell if a plant is opposite or alternate by the buds and not just by the branches. If I go back here um, and let's have a look at this ash, for example or maybe this um, red maple. So here I can see one branch coming off. But it doesn't look like there's another branch coming off here. And it could be that um, an animal snapped it off or the wind took it down or the plant just decided that um, it wasn't healthy and so it fell off. 
And so a lot of the time, a plant will sometimes have opposite branches and alternate branches, and it's a little bit confusing. But if we go into the bud level, here we can clearly see that there's no other buds. So this is the way that we know 100% that um, a plant is opposite or alternate. And here we have two buds opposite each other. So this is a willow and an elder. So um, la sol et le sucre, uh, right here. Um, and these are things that we can easily identify in the winter. Now, looking at a tree, um, it's uh, the very first thing I do is, is I have a look and see, is it alternate or opposite? And uh, this is kind of the first category I use to divide plants. And um, this uh, anagram here, back med, is, an, is a way to remember all of the opposite leaved trees. So th there's maybe one or two species that are a bit awkward that aren't in this list, but for the majority of them, um, if they are dogwood, elder, ash, buckthorn, maple, or chestnut, um, then they are go if they're, they're going to be opposite. And this is kind of the easiest way to break it down. So if you have a look at your buds and it's an opposite um, structure of a tree or the buds there, then you know that it's going to be in this group here. And this is a really um, simple way to break down like and, and there's all, like all of the others are ultimate or world. The world is um, a lot rarer. So it's generally going to be opposite or ultimate. Now, when we're uh, thinking about leaves, I'm going to teach you a kind of a handful of leaf structures, um, just some simple ones to begin with. The one on the left here, which is your classic maple leaf. And the way to remember this is there's one, two, three, four, five points just like the palm of your hand. So this is a palmate leaf. This shape here, this is an oval leaf, and this shape here, this is a heart leaf. Pretty simple um, plant structures. And these are all leaves that will be hanging around on the plant or maybe on the floor uh, during the winter time so that you can use to identify them. Next here, we have two leaves that are both parmate. We've got one, two, three, four, and there's another point here, five. One, two, three, four, five here. This is another palmate leaf. However, there's one key difference. This is a whole leaf here, and this is a um, compound leaf here. So the, um, sorry, it's made of five individual leaves. Uh, so this is what we call a simple or a compound. The whole leaf is simple, and the individual is a compound. And they're made up of five leaflets. Here we can see again, we have um, two simple leaves. And again, they're palmate. However, the difference is the edges. So here we can see this is a very, what we call a smooth edge. And then this one, it's jagged. It looks like it has teeth, like your, your bread knife, for example. So this is a serrated leaf. And this is something that when you get a field guide, it's going to talk about all these different terms. And they're also going to have um, a lot of more information. This is from Botany a Day. These are all the different leaves, uh, structures, and shapes that you can get. So I've given you an introduction here, uh, the handful. And um, this is here if you want to have a look later on. Now, identifying by the bark. So bark has its own language and um, it's a bit tricky, but give it practice and you'll start to learn and you'll be able to do some already without even knowing it. So this is um, a, what we call a smooth bark and it has these, what are known as horizontal etching. So there's kind of these little stripes here that go across it. This is one way that we can describe bark. It's nice and smooth. This is, um, which tree is this? This is the beech tree right here that makes beech nuts. And we have what are called lenticels. They're like these little ovals here. These are actually how the, the tree breathes and makes, uh, uh, exchanges gases between itself and the atmosphere. And so some of them, as we can see with these here, have some very distinct lenticels. 
This one, um, any idea? Does anyone know what these three trees are? The, um, the genus of them? Um, this is probably something that we can all recognize. Here we can see it has quite obvious lenticels, same here. And these, the lenticels are a lot narrower. And you can see that it's coming away in strips. Let's see, did someone get it? These are the boulot, merci. These are the birch, or uh, the boulot of Conseil. So for those who don't know, birch is a highly medicinal tree. You can make yourself a quite nice, um, it almost has like a, a black tea flavor. If you take some of these strips and just throw them in boiling water, um, you can drink them in five or 10 minutes to have a uh, mildly anti-inflammatory tea. There is the same um, uh, acid in here. It is called the um, salicylic acid, which is the precursor to uh, aspirin. So uh, it's a bit bitter, so you might want to add a bit of milk to this, but uh, this is something you can try. This is a um, silver birch, this is yellow birch, and then this, I believe, is your white birch here. So any one of those you can give a go just by uh, making a tea out of the, the strips of the bark. Um, Ridge bark. So here we can see these are three different oaks, and oaks are kind of easy to recognize by their ridges. So here we can see this one has long vertical strips with like a little bit of indentation, but not too much here. This one here has a lot of horizontal cracks. The ridges are maybe two, three inches long before they break up. And then this one here, it's a bit hard to see, but it's really, it's really like a, a, a mini mountain range in here. These are really deep ridges. So these are some of the, the words that we can use to describe uh, ridged bark. Here is the first tree that I learned to identify with its bark. Um, and we can see here, this one's a really common one around Montreal. It's called hackberry. And I'm going to talk about it more in our little walk. But first, just, wanna, just wanted to have a look. You see how it has multiple layers. And it really looks like it's kind of been printed in a 3D machine uh, with layers upon layers. And then there, there's these large spaces and there's not really much of a um, symmetry to it. So this is uh, the way that we can recognize Hackberry very easily just by having a look. Now, um, this is a map here of the Hackberry trees in Montreal. Um, and uh, these orange dots are where all the Hackberries are. This is from a map called fallingfruit.org, which you can access on your, for free on your computer. And the city of Montreal has put some of them, most of them are downtown. And so if you're thinking, oh, there aren't that many edible or medicinal species in Montreal, think again, because all of these orange dots are hackberry. And I'm going to talk a little bit later on about what hackberry gives us that is edible. So just a little, um, a little teaser there for you. Now, how to identify by seeds? Things to look for with your seeds. The seed pod structure, the number of seeds per flower, the remains of the seeds, and the seed dispersal method. How do the seeds travel away from the plant? So first, let's look at the structure. So here we can see that these cone-shaped flowers, these ones have lost their seed. These ones are still filled with seed, and they're nice and prickly. This is a very common plant that you can see all around Montreal. This is Echinacea. Echinacea is an indigenous plant in North America that has been used for its immune boosting properties. They've, they've had studies that have found that Echinacea is able to boost the production of your white blood cells. And so the seed, the flower, the leaf, the root, it's all medicinal. And uh, you can look into how to use this for yourselves. Generally, we make a tincture of the roots to get the most out of it. But even grinding up the seed and putting it into your food is something that we can do. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> so um, another structure, which is um, a really common feature here, we can kind of see that they kind of come out in spirals um, and a radial pattern around the stem here. These are the mustard family. And this is again from Botany in a Day here. So when we see um, something growing where the seeds are kind of popping out one by one in a spiral pattern around the stem. And if the seeds look like any of these uh, shapes, then it's in the mustard family. And to give you an idea of uh, the other plants that are in the mustard family, cabbage, kale, kohlrabi, Russell sprouts, 
um, cauliflower, did I say broccoli? I think so. So all of these are in the mustard family. So we're thinking, and the wild ones are even, like if you don't like the bitterness of broccoli, you're not gonna like the bitterness of wild mustards. They are extremely bitter. They are all edible, but they are certainly not tasty. Uh, not all of them, at least. I can tell you that from experience. So um, by recognizing this kind of um, spiral-like pattern coming off, this is um, radish here. These are radish seeds, which are also edible as well as the root. Um, we can spot the mustard family growing, sometimes just sticking above the snow. There'll be the, uh, the old stems from the previous year. It's quite an easy way to spot them. Number of seeds per flower. Tucked in here, we can clearly see that there's two seeds. Unfortunately, this is the only photo that I could find uh, without having to go out and take one myself, but I don't have a camera strong enough for it. Uh, there are actually four seeds per flower in the mint family. So if we go in here, one, two, three, four, there's four seeds tucked away. This is what the, um, the, the seed, the flower will look like once the petals have fallen off. And then if we peer inside, we should be able to see one, two, three, four, uh, seeds growing in there. And this is what um, a mint flower will look like after all the petals have fallen off. So if you go digging in there, and I recommend that you try a few different um, seed pods because some of the seeds may have fallen out, like what happened here. They probably got dried, matured, and then just blew off uh, with a bit of shaking from the wind. So kind of double check um, a few different flowers and count the number of the seeds. Seed remains. So these are really easy way to recognize things when there's no snow on the ground. Um, these are remains that some squirrels have been at. We can see these caps here. These are indeed acorns from oak trees. Nearly all of the acorns are edible. Uh, they need a lot of preparation. You've got to boil them or soak them in water for like five to seven days before they become palatable because they have a lot of them. Um, tannins in there, which need to be soaked and leached out before you can cook them. But acorns are extremely nutritious, very high in fat, very high in protein. And fats and proteins are kind of hard to find in most wild foods. One of my favorite spots for harvesting acorns in Montreal is going up the mountain and um, into the graveyard. Uh, around the graveyard, there's some beautiful old oaks and um, you can easily find a lot of acorns around there. And Try it out for yourselves. Like, it's a lot of work. Like, uh, you've got to take them out of the shell, soak them in water, and then you cook them. But it's a fun activity to do as a little experiment. And I know some people who powder it into flour, and then you can make acorn bread as well, because um, there's a gluten-like substance in the acorn if you soak it in cold water um, that can be used to make breads. This is another really common edible food that we find in Montreal. I wonder if anyone's seen like uh, at the end of fall, there's like these tennis ball like um, nuts that fall from trees. And this is the black walnut. And the green part will turn to this beautiful dark black, which we can actually use as dyes for paint, as well as um, fungal treatment on the skin. And then the seeds inside, squirrels love them. And you'll often see that there's like bite marks, or tooth marks around these nuts. And you can see there's no, there's no um, walnut left inside here, but these are very common around Montreal. They take a lot of work. You've got to crack them open and then pick out the meat inside. But again, it'd be a fun activity to try uh, for yourselves. Lastly, we have seed dispersal methods here. So this one here, I wonder if anyone's ever run in a field and then come out with a whole bunch of hooks uh, in their, um, their clothes. This is how this plant travels. Um, these are the ones that smell like rotten eggs. Aha, and people snap on them in the fall. No, I think you're talking about ginkgo. It has like a kind of a, a sour, cheesy smell um, and isn't, isn't attractive whatsoever. Black walnut, I don't think has much of a smell going on it. But yeah, so I think this is the ginkgo, which is also another edible seed, but you have to wash off that smelly, slimy um, uh, fruit first in order to kind of cook the seed uh, before. So this is um, a very common recognizable plant around Montreal. Uh, I'll tell you it in a second. These ones here, I remember watching these little helicopters fall from trees uh, as a kid. These are known as Samaras, is the technical term for them. 
helicopters works just as well. And then here on the right, we have like a beautiful, almost like a dandelion fluff. This is something that travels on the wind. So we have burdock here with the hooks. We have maples, as well as samaras, and then milkweed, which behind me here, this is what the uh, beautiful monarch um, butterfly is feeding off is uh, the milkweed, it's one of their favorite foods. And um, this is how we can spot them in the wintertime. You'll see those pods filled with this fluffy material. And uh, this is a very easy way to um, A, spot them, and then B, have some fun spreading some seed around and helping the butterflies out. Now, uh, talking about dead leaves, we also have some plants that have living leaves. And here, um, we're gonna get into the pine family. So, Pine is its own species, but it's also its own family. Now, what we call the um, plants that keep their needles in the winter is we call them conifers or evergreens. Nearly all of the evergreens are in the pine family. There's two, which I'll talk about later, which aren't, which are also very common. But in the pine family, we have Pines, larches, so say, um, say pain en français, the pines, larches, say uh, du melez, um, spruce, say epinette, kefir, um, I have this written down somewhere later on. I think it's epinette, no, c'est sapin, sapin, okay, and then hemlocks. Uh, Okay, I don't know that one in French, so you're going to have to forgive me with that one, but c'est pain, melez, epinette, pis sapin. And so these five different groups or different uh, genuses, the plants are all in the pine family. And I'm going to teach you now how to tell them apart. So in the pine family, there are one to eight needles wrapped in a membrane. So here we can see right uh, coming off the branch, there's this little little sheath here uh, and the uh, same thing here there's a little membrane coming out and this is how we recognize that something is in the pine fan. Uh, we have white pine and scots pine here you can tell it's white pine because it has five needles w-h-i-t-e that's an easy way to recognize white pine. or um, melez or the larches they're bright green deciduous so this is the only pine tree or the pine family tree that loses its needles in the winter time. It's not an evergreen, it's a deciduous plant. So that's the difference there. And they have these spirals. So they grow like a world arrangement almost uh, coming out of it. Next we have these ones, you can see here, there's no membrane. There's no, there's no connection here that's holding them between the branches. And they're quite spiky. So these are spruces. Spruces are spiky, sharp needles, and the cones hang down. Um, with your furs, they are flat and friendly. And so these are quite blunt. Um, they're not spiky at all. And the cones grow up. And here, this is the last one, this is your hemlocks. Now, these are short, blunt needles attached by a small stem. So we can see here the little small stem that attaches each of them. Now, out of the five that grow in the pine family, all of them are uh, edible or medicinal, um, except for the hemlocks, which are mildly poisonous. Now, I don't want you to be too afraid because we remember one of our principles, we start small. So when, you, when you're learning about a plant, you want to learn if it's edible or not, a great way to start is to take a little bit of the leaf, or the needle in this case, and nibble on the end. Have, have a quick nibble and spit it out. And then your tongue is really good at telling you what's poisonous, poisonous or not. Because if it's poisonous, it's going to be extremely bitter or it's also going to start burning the tip of your tongue. So uh, this is why we start very small and hemlocks are extremely bitter. So you'll know very quickly the other pines, for example, if I go back here and show you one of my favorite uh, nipples in the winter. You see this big juicy bud here. You can actually pick that off one of the Scots pines, pop it in and chew it like a gum. It's gonna have a beautiful piney flavor 
And it's also got a kind of a lemony citrus flavor because there's a lot of vitamin C in pine needles. And so um, you can use this to get a good dose of vitamin C in the middle of winter. And there's also a lot of resins in there which are antibacterial. So you can use it to help fight um, a sore throat, for example. And any, any of these that you nibble on are going to have that pine sour flavor apart from the hemlocks, which are going to be nasty and bitter. So you'll learn how to identify hemlocks in your own steam as well uh, by trying out just a little small nibble. Here we have two other kinds of evergreen or conifers that are very common around Montreal. The one on the left here is known as a cedar, and the one on the right here is known as a juniper. They both have uh, these scaly, waxy leaves, though the cedars are flat and the junipers are tubular. And you can kind of roll them in your, between your fingers and they'll roll around, whereas the cedars, they don't roll at all. Cedars have a nice apple flavor, the best way to describe them. Whereas jun junipers, for those who don't know, uh, junipers is one of the main flavors for gin. So uh, if you know what gin tastes like, you'll know what juniper tastes like. If you just nibble a little bit on the, uh, the needles there, you'll get this kind of beautiful, slightly bitter uh, gin flavor um, that you could then use in your cooking or something like that if you wish. Here we have a beautiful picture of some of the different bud structures that you can find in the middle of winter. And a lot of these you can use to identify the trees themselves. Uh, and I've got one here, the ash, which we're going to talk about later. And you're kind of, uh, the lime here is also the linden. This is another easy one to identify. And so there's a whole language for buds that I'm not going to get into today, but um, this is certainly another way that we can use to identify our plants. And then lastly, we have here, these are what are called catkins. Catkins, I always think of them as like little caterpillars dangling from the tree. These are um, wind pollinated plants. So actually what we're seeing dangling down here, this is the male part of the flower. This dangles in the wind and it releases its pollen into the air. And then this part, which is the cone or the female part, catches that pollen, gets fertilized and grows seeds. Um, if anyone suffers from allergies in the beginning of spring, it's because a lot of these plants are releasing their pollen into the air. Um, and those that grow catkins are alders, willows, birches, hazelnuts, and oaks, or calva is another way to remember that. So if you listen for the, uh, if you look for catkins, you can put it down to these five different plant groups, um, tree groups to help you identify. So. There we have it. This is the end of part one of our workshop. And I'm gonna just pause for a moment. If anyone has any questions, we're gonna get onto the virtual tour next. Um, so I'll give us a, a quick moment for questions. And I will also show you, these are some of my favorite books here. Um, again, you'll have access to uh, this is a slide, uh, so don't worry about um, taking notes. We also have some YouTube videos in here um, as well. There's the uh, wildflowersandweeds.com. This is for all the plant family diagrams out there. Then uh, we have some information on uh, uh, wild plants and how to use them. There's also an online database of Quebec plants here that has beautiful um, pressed photos of the plants growing in Quebec. And there's like so many in here and it's, it's completely free. Uh, this, is a, this one here is a 45 minute uh, movie on foraging around the world. And here we have the uh, map of old landfills and soil contamination in Montreal, as well as the difference between yarrow, poison hemlock and Queen Anne's lace or wild carrot, um, which are three plants that grow here in Quebec. Uh, and this video really takes a look into them in distinct detail. So now then, I will, if there's no questions, nope, good, I will go over to Google Earth. So you have already, some of you perhaps, had a look at Google Earth, um, the map without plant names. So the idea is that this is an application, for those who don't know Google Earth, 
you can um, open this on your computer, your desktop with no problem, or your laptop, and you can also download it as an application on your phone um, and then walk around with it. And the idea is that there's kind of two maps I've made of Park La Fontaine. One has no plant names. So if you want, you can watch the first half of this workshop and then walk around La Fontaine and try identifying them for yourself. And then you can go to the second tour, which has the plant names, or you can watch this video. I'm about to go through it one by one. And then you can kind of double check your knowledge. So I will go to the one with names here. And what we want to do is when you open it up, you want to click present. And so here it will zoom us in to beautiful Montreal. And for those who um, don't know this, it's pretty cool. Like it's a 3D map. You can zoom all around the city and have a look um, and uh, you know, find your house or whatever you wish. And uh, this is the first time I've tried making a map and I certainly had a lot of fun doing it. I chose Parc La Fontaine. I kind of asked where folks were and I figured this was the, the easiest one. Uh, it's in the middle of the city in, a, in between downtown and the plateau. And it has a lot of um, images already taken as well. So we go to the beginning, start here. So on this map, I have labeled um, the, the plant itself. And then this little diagram is the street view of the uh, plant itself. And for those of you who are wondering, well, this is all very good, but unfortunately, like this looks like the middle of summer. Like I can see here that there's people in shorts running around, like uh, this isn't much use to me um, in the beginning of spring, the end of winter. So I went last week and took a whole bunch of photos. So when you're in the street view, if you click on the photo, you'll be able to see the picture of the tree as well as the zoom up of the individual leaves and the trunk as well of each of these as of the, um, I think I did this last week, so talking the end of March, 2021. So let's go with the cedar trees. So we start down here, we walk up, here's Mr. Lafontaine, and this is the first tree we're gonna talk about here. It's the cedar tree. Now, this is what it looks like in the winter time. The way to recognize it, waxy leaves that are flat, we see here, like they're very 2D. Cedar is a wonderful medicinal plant. Um, the way to prepare it that I was taught by folk in Ganawagi is to boil it for two minutes, let it sit for 10, and then strain the plant material. You don't want to leave cedar sitting in hot water for a long time because this is a very oily plant and if you leave it for a long time there'll be a little layer of oil on top of your tea which can be an irritant to your kidneys and your liver if you drink a lot of it so we want to look after our bodies listen to some some traditional folk wisdom and boil it for two minutes let it sit for 10 and then strain it out and drink that what you can use cedar for is a great uh, antibacterial. It's also a kind of a, a, a cure rule for colds and flus, especially uh, for the lungs. If you've got a cough or a cold, you can make yourself a nice cedar tea uh, by boiling for two minutes, sitting it for 10, straining it out. Um, another thing that I really like to do with cedar is to put it in my bathtub. I will often boil it and externally, I'll let it boil for like 10, 15 minutes, no problem. And then I throw in the water and the leaves themselves into my bathtub, it smells beautiful. And it's also a really good muscle relaxant. It helps soothe those muscles, calm down your whole nervous system and make yourself a beautiful uh, bath. Would people who are severely allergic to tree nuts be able to drink pine tea safely? Yes, I would think so. Start, because there is, there's like, there's fats and oils and there's very little pine flavor in pine nuts, for example, right? However, um, uh, start slowly. I'm not a, I'm, this isn't, you know, I'm not a hundred percent certain. So when you do make yourself a pine tea, um, start with a very small sip, 
wait 10, 15 minutes, check in, see how you feel, if there's any itchiness in your throat or any of those other signs, I would stop there. But I would say that you're going to be okay. Um, generally speaking, maybe do some more research for yourself and look into it, but I don't think that there's much in the needles that's common with the nuts. Like the nuts are made of fats and proteins and carbohydrates. The needles have resins and a bit of vitamin C in there and not much else going on. So I think you would be safe, but again, I'm not a medical professional. So cedar. So this is quite an easy one to recognize. It's probably growing on your block. It's an extremely common plant. And this is one of the beautiful things I love about learning about wild plants. It's like if I'm going to a potluck or a friend's house in normal days and I want to bring something nice, uh, I will pick a little bit of cedar and prepare cedar tea for everybody at the end of the meal. And it's just a really nice way for people to get to learn how this plant uh, works. And I don't have to worry about bringing something to the potluck because I bring the tea. <laughs> Um, super. Okay, so that's the cedar tree there. Next, we are going over to, oh yes, the cattails. And FYI, I put the French here for each of them in the little box here. So cattails, um, for those who don't know, um, c'est uh, It's like a reed. It grows in the wet areas. You can see here that we're right at the bottom of the lake. And this is uh, something that you'll see at the top here. These are the very young flowers. We don't see them too much, but they have like a, it almost looks like a hot dog uh, growing on top of the flower. And, uh, oh, it is the flower, sorry. There's a male and female part of the, the, these two different flowers that grow on top of each other. And this is an edible plant. And now I, I should make this caveat here. I'm not suggesting that every plant that I talk about here you go to La Fontaine and you start eating. Like, I would not recommend that you eat this cattail here. It's in a pond filled with who knows what, as well as ducks and dogs and everything like that walking around. But the idea is you go to La Fontaine, you investigate this reed here, this cattail, you learn what it looks like, and then you go to a wild space that is a lot safer and has cleaner water, and then you can learn how to harvest that for yourselves. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the edible parts of the reed here are the flowers when they're still green. You can boil them and eat it like corn on the cob. And then around this time of year, when the spring shoots are coming up, you can actually pull them out of the ground and it looks like a kind of like a leek. And you peel back um, a few of the outer leaves and you boil them and then you can fry them. And they're quite delicious and they're very abundant uh, around us. And to give you an idea of what it looks like uh, in the winter. Now, some of these photos, there's like trash around. It's like the end of winter. No one's really been using the park for too much. And so they're not the prettiest of photos, but they are, they are exactly how we see it. Uh, so we can identify them from this tan colored um, paper like uh, material. There is another reed that grows around Montreal, which is Frankmites, which has a feathery top. And this one we don't want to eat. It's the cattails that have the hot dog going on. That we do. Um, so moving on, let's have a look. So over here, um, we have our first poisonous plant. Now, if I show you the street view, um, the street view is a little bit older, obviously, than my photos. And there's actually no bushes or shrubs growing here. But if we have a look at my photo, we can see clearly that the city of Montreal has planted this or let it grow. Um, hopefully they won't cut it down over the spring, summer, and it's still gonna be there. And this is red uh, dogwood. Now dogwood is a poisonous plant. Um, however, you can see that it's very bendy and it is a plant that has been traditionally used for basket weaving. So um, basket weaving is a, a hobby of mine that I've gotten into um, as my kind of passion for wild plants and learning a whole of like so many other things I can do with plants aside from eating them or putting them in tea. And the dogwood here, you can see very clearly, nice opposite uh, buds here, as well as some pale lenticels going along the red bark. And dogwood is a poisonous plant, so don't go sticking it in your mouth or anything like this, but we can use it for um, basket weaving, no problem. And it isn't here on the street view, so there isn't a view for it because it just wasn't there yet. 
Um, so let's go back here. So the dogwood, which is Cornier Rouge. Moving on, we have um, the Scots pine. So you already heard me talk about the Scots pine as something that we can pinch the buds out of and have a taste. Here it is. Look at all these nice people sitting there having their picnic. Uh, lucky people. Um, so here it is in the winter time. And the way to recognize Scots pine, it has like these paper-like, uh, papery white um, cells around the outside. And then again, we can see that sheath here. So we know it's in the pine family and it has one, two needles uh, coming out of there. Now these buds here, like I said, you can poke them out, you can pop them out and chew on them. You can also pick the buds and pickle them. You could put them in vinegar. You can take the entire branch, chop it up and uh, make some tea out of it if you wish. You can also chop them up. One of my favorite things to do with pines is to um, put them in vinegar and use that vinegar for cleaning. So after six weeks or so, it's fully infused. It's gonna smell beautiful, it's gonna smell pine-ish. And then you've got the antibacterial, antifungal properties of pine that you can then use to clean your surfaces. If you're looking for like a, a non-chemical uh, cleaning product, this is something that you can make yourself. And your, your kitchen or your bathroom is gonna have this beautiful pine smell that isn't fake, that isn't come from a supermarket somewhere. It's actually come from the local park. So this is a nice way to kind of get to learn how to use the, um, the pine tree here. And moving on, we have ash, Spanish en Francais. Now, you may have heard about ash trees because they are dying off in Montreal and all, all around Canada, really. And we can clearly see here from this street view that, yeah, this is one dead tree. We've got uh, one tree in full bloom here, another here, and then here is our ash. So there was an imported insect species, I believe it was uh, an Asian beetle, and you can see here how the bark has just fallen off of the branch. That's what happens. The um, beetle burrows into the bark and it carries a fungus on its back, which then kills the plant, unfortunately. However, um, it's still there. If we have a look, uh, on the, the photo that I took the other day, the, the tree's gone, it's been cut down. However, there's all of its offspring. So you see all of these um, uh, little um, seedlings sticking out of the ground. The way to recognize ash is, uh, my friend described it best, the, the, the buds, they look like insects, kind of like this weird um, scaly uh, praying mantis or something like that. And the buds are opposite. We can see here that they're opposite each other in like three pairs, one, two, three, four, five, six, right in there. And here we can see the, what we call the lateral buds, the buds on the side. They have like this little um, hat with like a horseshoe shape underneath. So this is another way that we can recognize the, uh, the ash tree here. And these are growing all along the back there. So basically this tree made a whole bunch of seed before it died and now they're all growing in this plant here, which is pretty cool. So it is surviving as much as it can for now. If we come over here, so we've walked, this blue line is your walking trail, by the way. We've come to this uh, little crosswalk here and there is a plant in here that's called comfrey. Now I haven't spoken about comfrey before, but it's quite an easy one to spot because uh, it's in this section, this box right here. There's a mix of it in here, and then it's totally in this box over here. Now, comfrey is a highly prolific plant. It, it is uh, known in permaculture as a really good fertilizer. People grow it under their fruit trees or in their vegetable patches. They cut it down and let it rot. It's really high in phosphorus and protein. So you can actually grow this plant to fertilize your garden. And for us on a human level, it's a really good musculoskeletal system tonic. So I know that uh, one of my herbalist teachers, she says, if you break a bone, you can start drinking comfrey as a nourishing herbal infusion to help the bone heal uh, from the inside out. And um, look in, you're gonna need more than this to identify it um, comfortably. Like uh, I'm not gonna talk more about how to identify comfrey or use it. Um, individually. This is up to you to do some research, but it's right here and it's right here. 
And for those of you who are maybe a little bit more, what's the word I'm looking for, clandestine, uh, this is an extremely vigorous plant. The city of Montreal is not going to miss a little root. If, you, if you're able to get from the ground a little bit of root, like an inch or two across, you can then, and it's quite thick, you can put that in your garden and it will grow a country plant. Just be careful because wherever you put it, the roots can, I've heard the roots can sometimes get 12 feet deep. So uh, once it's there, it's there for good. So you have been warned. And right now, there's really nothing to identify it. There is there's no plants grown here right now. They've all been squished by the, the snow. Um, so there's not really much to identify it in the winter time, but you take it from me that it's right there. It's kind of the only one that I just kind of included as a bonus uh, to have a look at for the uh, later in the year. So over here, we have a red oak. Um, nearly everybody knows how to recognize oak leaves. They have this beautiful kind of lobe. So these are called lobes, the tops where they kind of curl around. And um, oak trees have several lobes going around. And if we have a look here at the winter time, we can see not only are there plenty of oak trees on the floor, but there's also some hanging around still on the, the, the tree here. This is one I picked up off the ground. So here we can see that beautiful lobe pattern there. And as I mentioned earlier, oak is um, an edible tree in the sense that it creates uh, acorns for us to eat. The bark here is used medicinally as well. It's known as highly astringent plant. So this means that it tightens tissues, so we can boil the bark and use it as a wound wash to stop things from bleeding too much. I think it is also used as a, a treatment for hemorrhoids, not that I've tried that myself. And um, one last thing that I've used for the, uh, the, the leaves, they are extremely astringent leaves. And if you've ever tried making your own pickles, and I'm talking about fermenting, not, not using vinegar, so like doing a a lacto ferment for pickles, sometimes your cucumbers get a little bit mushy in the middle. If you throw in a handful of oak leaves as you're doing your lacto fermentation of your cucumbers, the 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 bit the, the astringency, so um kind of the, the 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 tannins that are in there help keep the structure of the cucumber crunchy so that your pickles on the inside don't get slimy. And they normally put a chemical in there, calcium something or other. To, to prevent this, but we can do the same just by including a handful of oak trees in our ferment. So, moving on, we have linden. Uh, this is tiol en français. Now, this is an extremely common tree. It's growing all around us, and it makes a beautiful flower. And the flower, uh, it isn't in this picture here, so you're going to have to do some research later on, but we can see there's some growing, I think it's growing around here. The flower is considered, um, one of my herbalists calls it the turmeric of North America in the sense that it's a very good anti-inflammatory. Now, the leaves are also edible. This is something I uh, that kind of blew my mind, was like, oh, oh I'm, I'm like buying spinach in a plastic box from the supermarket when I can actually eat leaves off a tree. Wow, okay. I'm never gonna look at spinach in a box again. <laughs> they're much better when they're smaller. These are quite mature here. We want to look for the heart shape. Um, linden or basswood, it's the other name, is actually in the, the mallow family. So it has um, the buds here, which I'll show you right here. The buds, if you chew on them, it shouldn't be bitter and it will have quite a gooey texture. And that gooeyness is what is the anti-inflammatoryness, uh, the anti-inflammatory part of the, the tree. Okay, no worries. Uh, thanks. And um, the, the tree, as you can see, uh, is no longer there, but the buds, nice fat red alternate with a handful of scales here is growing with um, abundance so yeah you can see here they cut the tree at a certain point and then yeah, i guess it got sick and they just had to cut the entire tree so it's growing uh, with uh, abundance right there and this is how we can find it um you see here as well someone's added a bit of graffiti to the, the shed maybe the city will paint that over who knows uh, so this is the linden tree the flowers that i use the most the, the leaves are, are tasty enough, but I wouldn't make an entire salad out of them either. I would still mix it around with other things. 
Moving on shortly down the road, we have burdock or bar dan en français. This is actually one of the wild foods that we can find in supermarkets. It's normally in um, Asian culture, uh, Asian supermarkets. It's called gobo. It's this large leaf plant growing here at the bottom. And that's a bit tricky to identify of the, the first uh, try. However, I have to suspicion that it is permitted to go out and collect leaves, roots, things like that in public places. Um, good question. Officially, no. However, with, with the right respect, like I, so here's my experience. Um, yeah, gogo and sweet sauce is, is very delicious. Yeah, it's normally fried in Japanese restaurants. It's really tasty, and it's the same burdock that we have growing around here. Um, so to answer your question, like if you took a spade and you went to Parc La Fontaine and you started digging up this burdock, you're probably going to annoy some people. Like, uh, and if you have like city officials around, they're not going to be too happy with you. If you go to the linden and you pick the flowers, no one's going to care. Like I've gone to many parks and it's actually quite nice because um, people stop and they ask you what you're doing. And you get it, you have a moment to share um, a little bit of knowledge and maybe get to know your neighbors. So generally what I have found is picking leaves, berries, flowers, not a problem as long as you're not like stripping the tree, which you know, we've learned that we're not going to do. Picking things up, a little less accepted, um, like that come free, you know, be sneaky. <laughs> and uh, don't make it too obvious. And um, don't do it when there are city people around uh, and you'll be fine. Like, I think as long as your intentions are good, you're gonna be okay. But honestly, um, officially, like I'm teaching you this so that you can learn how to identify it in other spaces and harvest it in your own backyard as burdock grows in people's backyards all over the place. Um, the ESO, I hope that answers your question. Coming back to how to identify burdock. So in the first year, it's just leaves on the ground, big, broad, kind of heart-shaped, uh, spade-shaped leaves. But in the second year, it makes the Velcro like sticky balls that stick to your clothing or if you've ever had a dog run through a field and it gets covered in these uh, you'll know that how, how much of a pain they are so this right here is what happens to burdock in the second year it grows a flower it makes seeds and it dies so if you see these growing around you know that there's burdock uh, both first and second year burdock growing around um, that you'll be able to learn how to identify uh, and another th uh, fun thing, so something I've done with campfires, you can actually take these leaves, uh, wrap like an apple or a potato or some, some fish, for example, you wrap them in five to six layers of these leaves and you can throw them on the, on the fire the same way that you would use tinfoil. So keep in mind that they do burn out eventually, so uh, you do need to change them. And here's a little bonus. This is a little milkweed here um, growing. The way that you identify milkweed is if you break um, a bit of the stem, it'll bleed this white latex, and that is a, uh, uh, a way to identify your milkweed. Okay, moving on. How are we doing for time? Okay, I'm aiming to finish for nine o'clock, just to focus on. So tamarack. This is our larch, or our tamarack. Uh, this is the only deciduous conifer, so it's going to lose its needles. Here we can see it's a nice, beautiful green, and here we can see that it is completely naked. There are no green needles on here. If we zoom in and have a look, we can see there's the cones and these are the buds here that are about to, to, to burst uh, into new needles. If you have a taste of those buds, beautiful citrus, pine-like flavors. And this is what the bark looks like. We've got ridges that are kind of irregular with long vertical cracks and not much horizontal. So this is another way that you can identify your larch here. Now, moving on, we have a blue spruce. This is right here by the building. Now the blue spruce um, tucked in here, I wasn't able to jump. I didn't jump over the fence and take a closer look. So it's, it's a, there's a tiny one here tucked away. This is what it looks like in the, in the, the march here. And this one, um, blue spruce is like a common ornamental plant. I don't think I have ever tried the tea from this. 
something tells me it's not going to be too good. I don't read much about my, in my herbalism books about blue spruce being a medicinal plant. So this is just one to learn how to identify. It's called a blue spruce because you can quite clearly see compared to the green pine here that there's a lot of, uh, there's a bluish tinge to it. There's a lot of blue in this. And this is what was used in a lot of countries as their first Christmas trees. Um, we have over here next to this building, a Norway spruce. So this, if we have a look here, it's this one right here by the building that I'm looking at, uh, tucked away at the side here. And I was able to get closer to this one. This is what the bark looks like. Smaller, almost like plate-like um, bark here. And they're like one inch across. And if we have a look, we can see there's no membrane and there's sharp pointy edges. If you really grab that, you're going to get a handful of quickles. So this is how we recognize the spruce uh, of the plant. Moving along here, we have hackberry. So I was talking about this earlier. This is the one that we can really identify from its bark. And there's like one, two, three, four hackberries all planted here in a row. And if the bark, uh, we have a look, this is it in the winter. And if that bark with its kind of 3D uh, ridged um, structure, which is the really the way that we recognize it in the winter. And if you're lucky, I think the squirrels, you see here, there's nothing left on this tree in terms of berries. But if you're lucky, this is what you'll find. And there's the, the beautiful dark brown, reddish color. The other name for hackberry is sugarberry because these are delicious. They kind of taste like they have a flavor of dates, but they remind me of M&Ms. They're, um, they're very hard. There's a hard crunch. So you have been warned if you've got some weak teeth in the back of your mouth, be careful. Uh, you can just kind of suck the, there's like a thin, there's a thin coating and then a, quite a big seed. But the seed is filled with oils, filled with proteins, and together it makes like this really nice crunchy m and And as I was showing you earlier in the falling fruit uh, diagram, berries are all around Montreal. Um, and they're kind of one of my favorite things when I'm waiting for a bus or for a friend. I'll have a look around and see if I can find a hackberry to, to munch on a few of the, the berries. And it's uh, a really tasty one to find and quite a common one around the city too. Next, we have another Scots pine here. This is the only duplicate I put in here because I wanted to show you what Scots pine looks like when it gets a little bit older. So this is right in front of the, the little puppet area. This is the Scots pine here. And this is what it looks like in March time. And when Scots pine gets a little bit older, we can see here how red the bark becomes. It starts losing a bit of its scales. And this is another way that we can recognize the Scots pine. Great. Moving on, we have the yew tree. So the yew and the hemlock are the only two, as far as I know, um, poisonous coniferous trees. They look very similar. So your hemlocks and your yews are quite difficult to tell apart. However, um, they both don't have any pine flavor to them. So again, if you just nibble a little bit, it's going to be extremely bitter. You're going to want to spit it out straight away. And this is a, a, a good chance that you um, discovered the yew or a hemlock tree. And another way to identify them, flat needles, dark gray. There's no like pine or resin. If you break, if you break, if you don't want to try nibbling things because you're afraid of them, you can just break the, the leaves between your fingers and have a sniff and you're going to get no pine flavor whatsoever, no pine or resinous um, aroma. So this is a good way to recognize that this is not one of those edible pine things. And moving on, we have over here, we have a red pine, very similar to your Scots pine and how to use it. It's this big tall tree here uh, growing by the side. There's like a little grove of them here. Um, and I thought this was a white pine at first, but then I got in there and here we can see there's only two needles. So this is a red pine, uh, not all red pine, not, there's many different two needle uh, uh, trees, but this is a red one. I used it in my book and my app to figure it out. Edible bud, 
Uh, try making a tea or out of needles if you wish as well. And also um, a nice side note, another thing that we can try from the pine species is all of, you see all of this sap here, this resin, this you can actually pick it off the tree, roll it into a bowl and chew it like gum. Um, and it's uh, antibacterial, antifungal, it's gonna clean your mouth. Uh, just start slowly, I haven't quite figured out um, some of the pine sap gets stuck to your teeth and it's like there for hours and it's no fun whatsoever. And some of it is really chewable and it's like gum and it lasts like five, six hours and then it disintegrates and, and, and that's the end of your gum. So try a small bit first, see if it sticks to your teeth or not. If it doesn't, just go ahead and keep on chewing it. If it does, uh, you can still chew it, but just keep in mind that you're going to have this annoying, annoying pine resin stuck in your teeth for the next few hours. Uh, take it from me. As a side note, on a survival point, uh, the pine resins are extremely flammable. Uh, you can use these if you roll them up in a, in a bowl of paper. This will burn almost like candle wax. It's that kind of flammable. It's, uh, and down here, we can see there's even older resin down there. This is often what I use to make incense as well. Um, like your traditional frankincense or myrrh, which are also different resins. Okay. So we have, I think one or two more. Um, we have a silver birch. There's not many birches in uh, Parc La Fontaine, but I was able to find this one right here. It's uh, pretty zoomed in, but we can see it nonetheless from the street view. Uh, so it's this one right here. There's like two of them planted together. This is what they're looking like in March. And again, catkins. The birches grow catkins, so this is a way that you can recognize it. And here we can see that nice papery bark with the lenticels in here. The bark, as I mentioned earlier, is a great tea as well as a really good fire starter. And uh, some of the birches I like to use, uh, use to weed baskets out as well. So uh, that's the birch. And the young leaves are edible as well. That's uh, something that I've had a, quite a, a good uh, experience with in the past. Now, uh, the last one on here, this is kind of a little bonus because um, I couldn't find any fir trees in La Fontaine. I got all the other pines apart from the fir. But as I was leaving, I found on the side of the road someone's old Christmas tree. Uh, <laughs> so I can't promise you that this will be there uh, when you take your walk, but at least I can show you how to identify a Douglas fir. Um, here it is in all its glory, left out in the trash, unfortunately. Uh, has kind of scaly, knobbly bark and with red undertones to it. And here we can see that the needles are really round. There's like no um, poke to them at all, as well as them being quite flat. They just kind of spray out uh, like this rather than round like the spruce does. So I think that is the end of the tour. So there you have just going from the southern side to the northern side. It'll probably take you half an hour to 45 minutes to walk this by yourselves. And like I say, you can do the version I have here where um, there's no names. You can see oh, without names. So we can um, practice by ourselves if you want. And then you can kind of write down your answers. And then once you've, you've done it by yourself, you can double check on the one with the names uh, later on. And pretty much everything you need to identify, maybe not the individual species of the pine or the fir, for example, but to recognize if it's a, a pine or a lodge or a spruce, everything you need to know is in the first part of the, um, the workshop. So you can try that out for yourselves, maybe have a a second watch over before you go out and then off you go to explore. So uh, if there are any final questions, now is a good time to ask. Otherwise, I will say thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the workshop. I'll stop sharing here.